Welcome to Texans on Tap, episode 11. I'm Brandon Strange alongside Charlie Palillo and Josh Jordan. Follow them on X at Palillo and at Josh Jordan 975. Jack Brame is our producer. Uh, you can support our new channel by hitting like on this video and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube. And if you prefer listening to your podcast, every episode is available on your favorite podcast app and give us a five star rating while you're there. And before we get into that Texans talk, Uh, Just a quick reminder, we're inviting you to join us at the tailgate on October 25th at uh, Silver Street Studios. There's the right banner. Silver Street Studios, October 25th. We're celebrating all things Houston sports with the tailgate-inspired eats, signature cocktails and activities, VIP ticket holders get in early and get to meet and greet with former Texans player Jonathan Joseph. So go to tailgate.culturemap.com and use promo code SPORTSMAP to get $10 off any ticket type. The food and drinks are included in the price. We'll also put a little card up on the top of the corner if you're watching on YouTube, and you can just click there, and it'll take you straight to the website. Uh, This is our second year doing it. Last year was a blast. This year will be even better. And guys, speaking of even better, Texans. uh, It was kind of the same story as last week, kind of an ugly game. It wasn't pretty, but it was enough to get the win. And, um, I guess the, uh, as we get into, uh, the open week where you've, you're three and three with as many wins as you had all last season, not as many ties. Uh, but while it wasn't his best game, Charlie CJ Stroud made enough good plays for the uh, Texans to get the dub. Uh, he gives up an interception that results in a first down and positive yardage. Sometimes things just break your way. What did you see? Well, I'm starting with a quick aside. Magnificent use of open week as the NFL and media and all the other lemmings who've latched on to using bye week improperly for decades. It's one of my all-time sports pet peeves. Okay, C.J. Stroud. Uh, By some measures, he had his worst game so far, which is saying that he hasn't had any lousy games so far. He wasn't going to go his entire career without throwing an interception. He made a terrible throw, right? He didn't see the linebacker. But if you're into a football god smiling down, C.J., you're entitled to one. So the Saints fumble it back on the very same play. And then the Texans go down the field and score. And Stroud floats a beautiful pass where Dalton Schultz could make the play and only make the play to haul it in for the touchdown. Uh, It continues to be so far so good that you can win when Stroud did not have his A game. uh, Basically a 50% completion day uh, with the interception in the mix. Three and three is not a miracle. And it's not supposed to be terribly difficult in the NFL to go from atrocity to at least the minus side of mediocre but off the last three years doesn't this almost feel miraculous so if you can feel better about a team being three and three six games in with a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback i am unaware of said other team yeah i mean you just look at some of the other rookie quarterbacks. It looks like Anthony Richardson's going to be out for the year, looking like they're going to opt to do that shoulder surgery. So he's done. And, and then you look at, at Bryce Young, they, they're winless. So for the Texans to be going into the open week at three and three, CJ Stroud looking like the offensive rookie of the year, and, and no Tank Dell this week, and arguably the best defense you've played all season. It, it, I mean, that's pretty impressive. I, I really like what I saw from CJ Stroud. He overcame that interception quickly. No big deal. He also got sacked in this game. So, you know, but he was okay. He was fine. That's going to happen in football. If you're going to throw some interceptions, you're going to get sacked sometimes. We've just been a little spoiled. But, you know, the, what he was able to do without Tank Dell, I thought it was interesting. Noah Brown played a lot more than, than I thought he would returning from the IR. So, you know, the running game, that's the thing we'll point to. We like that they got Singletary going. He had zero carries the week before. Damian Pierce still having some trouble. A lot of the tight ends not blocking great. So part of it's there. But I think they're going to have a big advantage with running the ball when they come back from the open week. They've got a really good matchup against Carolina. I think they're like 31st in the league. So I'll be looking for that when they get back back playing in action here in about two weeks. Oh. Apparently, the Texans have been listening to the Texans on Tap podcast because one of the things that we did call for was uh, some creativity in the plays. We saw a little bit more of uh, creativity, uh, especially in getting guys like Hutchinson involved and Boone involved, uh, you know, just giving a little bit of variety. You, you talked about Singletary. And it, it seems like, you know, some of those guys, especially when you're scheming it right, can really be assets for you outside of Pierce. Um 
and then looking at, on the defense, defense was stout. I mean, really, what? And it seems like I mean, there's at times in which they're gashing the defense, but it's just like with Atlanta. It seems like it's a very bend but not break uh, mentality on these defensive stands. They hold New Orleans to just three points in the second half, and none in the fourth quarter. Is the Texans' defense ahead of where we thought they'd be in Week Six? Mm, interesting question. Uh, if we're going to grade on a curve, as they've strung together three solid defensive games in a row, Steelers, Falcons, Saints, well, uh, they rank 30th, 29th, and 24th in scoring, the Steelers, the Falcons, and the Saints. So it's not as if they're shutting down really good offenses. But again, given the last three years, when the Texans could basically stop nobody. I mean, teams could run the ball nearly at will, 170 yards per game allowed on the ground a year ago. Um, so, and again, still without Derek Stingley, uh, the defensive front, I thought yesterday, wreaked a pretty good level of uh, havoc uh, against a credible, uh, if a little bit dinged, Saints offensive line. Uh, so you just want to see progress. And if they wind up in the race in December, then you, you change the standards. But this is just a coherently coached football team that's into playing every week. And I'm not going to say that's half the battle in the NFL, but it is a chunk, you know, in an emotionally intense game. If you're bringing it every week, they again on Sunday win the turnover battle, committed what, just three penalties in the game. Uh, They're not there yet in terms of overall talent, but talent base is much upgraded obviously starting most significantly with C.J. Stroud. And if you minimize those shoot-yourself-in-the-foot type things, right? no four encroachment penalties uh, against the Saints, uh, you have a chance to be in most games that you're playing. And and here they are, 3-3. Three and three, And maybe when they play Jacksonville a month from now with a chance to sweep the season series and take the tiebreaker, the Texans will legitimately and firmly have announced their presence in the AFC South race this season season yeah they're they're taking little baby steps with the defense where you know they they were the worst at getting run on last year it's been like that for several seasons but if we look at it now rushing yards against their 16th so middle of the pack you'll take that from when they were 31st or 32nd last year the one area you'd like to see a little more improvement is the sacks they're 31st second to last so they're just they're not getting guys on the ground as much but the pressure's there I thought Will Will Anderson played great on Sunday Daniel Jeremiah shouted him out really liked the way he performed so that's what's good CJ Stroud Will Anderson th- these guys look like real players it looks like you nailed these picks Tank Dell that looks like a hit as well as long as you know, the concussion doesn't linger or anything like that. So in the defense, let me get back to that. Steven Nelson could have had three interceptions on Sunday. I mean, he had the one at the end of the game, but he had his hands on the football a couple times. Uh, the Rashid Shahid pass, the, the deep one, he had a chance at that one, and he had a chance at another one. So that impressed me as well. And then this is just kind of my opinion. Typically, penalties don't go the Texans' way. I feel like the officials are like, oh, it's the Texans. On Sunday, I felt like a lot of the penalties went the Texans' way. Noah Brown, I think two PIs were called on him. Nico Collins had a PI called on him into the end zone. So even though maybe C.J. Stroud didn't have the best statistical day, there are a lot of deep passes where he was forcing some action, he got the calls, and they they capitalized on that. Brandon, you mentioned earlier, uh, Ben, don't break, right? It's one of the football uh, maximums of defense. A hallmark back when Bill Belichick was a good coach. Uh, The Patriots would give up yards, but in the red zone, they would just clamp things off and uh, made a great habit of holding teams to field goals instead of touchdowns. Now, in part, I think Derek Carr uh, reestablished his his mediocre brand yesterday. I mean, that last drive, just throwing it in the end zone, play after play after play. What are you doing? Um, But for the Texans to hold them to even a field goal attempt, if if, uh, uh, Gruby hadn't blown it, Right, you're still holding them to three. You're keeping yourself in front. So for the Texans to hold a team to 13 points in a game in which the Texans D yielded 430 yards, right? They were outgained in the game 430 to 297, and obviously there were no garbage time yards involved for the Saints. They're trying to come back, and they were able to get the ball down the field into that red zone. Uh, but the Texans were then able to button things up. And uh, generally, if you're giving up threes instead of sevens, that's a winning formula if your offense is doing anything. And on a couple of drives, when threes become zeros, 
So uh, I was just a good, solid win with an engaged crowd. And uh, I just like the circumstances. Obviously, you have a, a healthy percentage of Saints fans in the building. I just think that enlivens it both ways. And it's just good to have a vibrant, engaged Houston Texans fan base with a team worth rooting for other than, well, they're my team. I think one of the encouraging things was the adjustments from week to week as well on defense, because last week against Atlanta, uh, when they were trying to blitz, it was, you know, they were, they were bringing the blitz, which left one-on-one coverage and Atlanta would just get these big gains. And against the saints, when they needed to stop, they brought the house and really put pressure on Derek Carr. And I think that was really one of the big differences in being able to get definitive stops on third down, um, and Charlie, I want to go back to something you said. Texans are three and three now tied with the Colts uh, behind the Jags, whom they have already beaten this season. A lot of people that are smarter than me are looking at the schedule and saying that there's a path for the Texans to contend. You've flirted with that idea already in this discussion. Texans could get Stingley back, you know, looking to get Scruggs back. So they're going to be a better team overall, you would think. What What is the likelihood that Texans are fighting for a playoff spot down the stretch? I really think the hinge game is the Jacksonville game. Uh, there's a month worth of games between now and then. The Texans have their open week this week. The Jaguars get there in a couple of weeks. Well, before the Jaguars get to NRG Stadium, uh, the Texans have a pretty manageable schedule at Carolina. I mean, the Texans haven't done enough to call that a trap game, and you'll have had the open week to get ready for it. But the Panthers are horrible. So if you go win that one, I know the Bucs have been credible to this point, but no one's thinking, oh, no, Brady and the Buccaneers are rolling into town. No, it's Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers coming to town. Okay, at Cincinnati, it's been bumpy for the Bengals, but that's one if you're just going to go win, loss, loss, win, loss. That's one that you'd say, boy, if they win that game, wow. But if you call that a loss, then you have the Cardinals, who uh, have been a little friskier than some might have expected, expected with Joshua Dobbs at, at quarterback. But as a quartet of games – You're thinking, well, three and one's not beyond the pale. Even if you go two and two there, you're probably remaining in touch of Jacksonville. And then if you sweep the season series uh, with the Jaguars. Uh, Meanwhile, Jacksonville has a couple of road games followed by a home date with the 49ers uh, ahead of uh, getting to Houston. So, yeah, it's not it's not pipe dream million to one shot territory. Uh, In the end, though, I think if the Texans are going to be in the division race to the end, they're going to have to be Jacksonville for a second time. Yeah, it's about Jacksonville. I mean, you look at the Titans, Ryan Tannehill got banged up. We'll, we'll see how bad of an injury that is. So that limits them. We mentioned Anthony Richardson, likely done for the year. So it's Gardner Minshew. I mean, and possibly Malik Willis or Will Levis at quarterback. So it's going to be that Jags game. It, it's interesting. You know, the Texans have gotten a lot better since the first two games of the season. You can just see it on TV. They, they look more crisp, and which makes sense. New quarterback, new coach. It's going to take a while. Jacksonville, on the other hand, they've, they've been kicking butt since they lost to the Texans. So, you know, we'll kind of see how that plays out. But I mentioned earlier, Carolina, they're actually – 30th in rushing yards allowed per game. They're 31st in in points allowed per game. So the Texans are ever going to get this run game going and just the offense, just clicking on all cylinders. The the Panthers feels like the game for that to happen. So you don't really look at the schedule. Nobody scares you all that much. It's pretty incredible. You feel better with CJ Stroud than pretty much all these other quarterbacks. You know, you could argue Trevor Lawrence, but you could argue CJ over Trevor Lawrence, actually. And that really does seem to be the difference is when you have trust in your quarterback, which I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I look at CJ Stroud and I just think this is the best passer that the Texans have ever had in the history of the franchise as far as accuracy and just, you know, being able to get rid of the ball. I I just, I don't know who's better than him. Obviously you could argue that a guy like Deshaun Watson was more dynamic of a player, but as far as just a pure passer, I don't know that there's anyone better than CJ. So that's going to bring us to our player of the game. Uh, Guys, who was your player of the game for Saints Texans? Well, I'm going to go to the defensive side of the ball because the offense was, was middling and the Texans give up just 13 points. I haven't narrowed down to two guys. I'm going to go with Blake Cashman, who by name sounds as much like a country singer to me as a a football player. But uh, this is a fifth round draft pick a few years ago, knocked around. You know, he was with the Texans all last season, uh, almost all special teams, a 15 tackle game for Blake Cashman. Sometimes tackle stats can be deceptive. 
right? If you make 15 tackles because the team you're facing has a 13 play 79 yard touchdown drive, well, you made 12 tackles on that drive, but you couldn't stop them. Uh, but a game you only gave up 13 points and, and Cashman in the middle of the field in on 15 tackles. Uh, that's my guy for the Texans Saints game. Yeah, uh, doubling back to the quarterback talk just a minute ago. Joe Burrow is on the schedule, so you'll give him the you know give him the check mark over CJ. But that's about it. As far as player of the game, I'm going to go with Steven Nelson. He, he made the the game clinching interception there, and like I said, he got his hands on several footballs. He's been, I mean, without Stingley, you've really needed him to step up, and and that was with some real receivers, Chris Olave and Michael Thomas and Rashid Shaheed. I mean, those are some good receivers. Just kind of shows you maybe Derek Carr is not playing so great. So I'll go with Steven Nelson for my player of the game. Shocker, Derek Carr not playing great. Guys, yeah. that's going to be it for this week's episode of Texans on Tap. We'll be doing an early look at Texans Panthers in next week's episode. Give us a follow on your favorite podcast app to get that. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to click like and subscribe to this channel and all the links to everything, whether it's our socials or the podcast links, those are all in the description. Thanks for listening. As always, go Texans. Go Texans.